Okay, tonight I'm going to try to give you something interesting from the work I do. My sister, Patty Ward, who works in the, the Arboretum of the Japanese Garden, once told me that I'm known as Dr. Doom around her set, set of colleagues. So I'll try not to make it too depressing, but you know, this whole life and death stuff, you do, you do get it. What Don Brown and I have been trying to do for a long time is try to understand change on the planet, and really what is an Earth-like planet? And you start seeing Seti and other people trying to understand what is it about Earth that makes us Earth-like? And this is kind of a joke in a way, because you study Earth history, you recognize that what we're calling Earth-like now is just a tiny little smidgen of what Earth was like in the past and what it will be like in the future. We are in a time when civilization demands that we do not change. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers builds the Mississippi so it can't wander. We try to build docks. Seattle has a seawall that we hope lasts forever. And we're even building a tunnel. The problem is that nature just doesn't like to not change. That there are inherent changes within climate and climate vagaries. That the planet itself is like a person in the sense that it gets older as does the carbon cycle. And so here we are trying to say, OK, nothing can change, and yet change it is coming. Now, the two biggest changes that I see coming are stemming both from the same thing. And they both relate back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide obviously is rising. Um, I don't think anybody in this room has noticed that, unfortunately, while we have the coldest March I can remember, the Midwest and the East Coast had the hottest. Now, those were extraordinary temperatures. When you see 20 degrees above normal in places like Chicago, while we were working in the Central Valley of California uh, just two weeks ago, we had a snow of 1,000 feet. The whole valley, where it was supposed to be 60, 70, even 80 degrees, was down to the 30s and the 40s. So the planet is really going through some interesting gyrations now. And it really does appear to be related all the way back to carbon dioxide. So CO2 does a nasty thing, such as warming the planet. But carbon dioxide is also absolutely necessary for life on this planet. All the carbon in us was at one time carbon dioxide. It comes in and out of organic molecules. And those carbon molecules are, again, transitory. And they come in and out of life itself. So you think that too much carbon dioxide, there could never be too much. But in fact, we're seeing the effect now of the climate that gets warmer and warmer. Well, from my own work on mass extinctions, it's quite clear now that most of the mass extinctions are related not to impact, not to the, the Armageddon or the deep impact movies that we got to see. But in fact, we now call them greenhouse extinctions. Plants and animals don't do well if they are relegated to a certain spot, and yet the climate goes up, 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 up. And secondly, ice caps don't do well in a world where we have carbon dioxide that's rising. What the geological record tells us that, in fact, when carbon dioxide hits 1,000 parts per million, in the past, there has never been any ice cap, never any ice sheet in Antarctica, never the presence of thick, thick ice. And so we don't have that luxury. And the whole question is, if we continue to raise CO2, are we going to have 1,000 parts per million? And if we do, will there be ice anywhere? <laughs> OK, so let's think about carbon mass extinctions. When I began my career, it was well known that mass extinctions were long, slow events. They were part of uniformitarianism. And they took place by climate change. What's well, interesting how we go full circle. Then, in 1980, the Alvarez has discovered the evidence of a large body impact. So a large body impact seemed to be a convenient way. I mean, it makes perfect sense. A great big Mount Everest-sized rock comes down and hits the Earth. All kinds of nasty things accrue from that, and you kill off all the dinosaurs. So change. And 1990 to 2000, it was really suspected that, in fact, all mass extinctions were caused by impact. And yet, the last decade suggested that, indeed, they're not. And everyone except the dinosaur killer was caused, in fact, by short-term global warming. And now even that one is under attack for work that our group has been doing in Antarctica. So we began this whole business, and it relates back in terms of change to these animals. This is Nautilus on the right, and a second living cephalopod with an external shell. 
Alamo novelists. The one on the left has only been seen by two scientists in history, or one of those. We found this in 1984 in Manus Island. It's never been seen since, but there were plenty of them there at the time. Unfortunately, the shell is now very, very valuable on eBay, and the shell hunters are, might be the way that this thing is done in. In fact, the reason I'm interested in these novelists has survived all the mass extinctions. It's gotten through every one of these crises. So what is it? What is it about this particular creature, among so many others, that does let it be a survivor? And so out of the blue, two years ago, U.S. Fish and Wildlife came to me and said, look, we're, we want to, we think we want to list it on CITES. CITES is the international agency that says whether something's endangered or not and does something about it. But no one knew how many novels were out there. And so for the last year and a half, we've been using machines like this. This is what we Brubs, a baited remote underwater video system. Um, we've got two HD cameras on the left and the right, and a large, powerful light in the middle. So it goes down to 300 meters, 1,000 feet. Sits there for eight hours, and you get to time how long it takes for animals to come and find the bait. Pretty cool, because all kinds of interesting stuff down there at 1,000 feet deep in the Pacific comes wandering up. But this becomes a very good quantitative way to understand population sizes and how many of these things are out there. So I'm hoping this works. This was one of the videos that came up, uh, and I guess you could call this not in my house. There's my Nautilus sitting there, not doing much, and one, two, three. <laughs> Huge shark goes rolling through here. Uh, no one has ever seen that creature before. And it was such a shock to me, because this thing was not actually coming after the bait. This thing was saying, you know, I really don't like this trap in this cage down there. And you humans, with all your disruptions, I wish you weren't doing that. So our work is also in the Philippines. And the Philippines is really ground zero for the extinction of novels, because the extinction of local populations is taking place. And here is the local way in which it's been fished for generations, perhaps centuries, really low tech. And yet this low tech is sufficiently uh, energetic to have wiped out a, a good portion of these animals within the Philippines. And here we are in New Guinea. This is even a cooler low tech boat that I got to spend two days on with uh, remote transmitters. And a whole bunch of guys with kava that were just stoned out of their minds. So it was an interesting two days. And here's our tunnel. Well, how does this fit in? How is this related? Well, the tunnel is, an, is a, something that we're building that will not admit change. And the tunnel is actually to be threatened by the same thing as threatening the Nautilus and threatening sea level and threatening all of us. And the reason that even the Nautilus is threatened is that global warming is producing huge masses of low oxygen that are killing off reefs in the Western Pacific. And for our own intensive purposes, the design constraints on the tunnel were made four or five or six years ago or before at a time when no one really believed that global warming was going to be as severe as it seems to be turning out to be. And only a meter and a half, I believe, was engineered in. So if, as long as we have less than a meter and a half, we're fine. But this is engineered in the last a century. So the bet is that we're not going to have more than a meter and a half in the next 100 years, or all bets are off on this particular tunnel. Now, none of us will be driving around 100 years from now unless there is some radical new departure in uh, Obamacare. But in this particular case, this is an odd thing to be building at this time in history, if you ask me. So global warming is polarizing. It's very much like evolution was 10 years ago. So here we have two words that polarize and are used in very, very, well, let's say obnoxious ways. Again, we've got this sense that somehow it has been thought up by the scientists, and then we have climate gain, which suggests that the evil scientists are actually maliciously doing this. Or maybe at the best, it can be warming, it's beneficial, but we are finding that, in fact, in almost every case, global warming isn't beneficial, at least not to crops. The crops don't do better at higher CO2 in many cases. The yield goes down. 
Faster growth that leaves, less growth of what you really want, seems to be the story. So this whole idea of change, which planet is Earth-like, goes back to our sense that through time, we have had nothing but change. And if we start at the far left, our planet is entirely covered with water. On the far right, we have the planet in the far future where it has no water whatsoever. We've got this happy medium in between. But we're going to see rising sea level, rising sea level, rising sea level, because ice caps are endangered on this planet. Our sun gets hotter every single year. Sooner or later, we get to the point where no ice caps are possible. And in fact, with our carbon dioxide now, we are a precursor to what will eventually happen. In fact, if you look at all the history of life on Earth, you can think of us as the nice white animal middle part of the Oreo sandwich in between two very dark ages. From four and a half billion years ago, the first life starts about 3.7 billion years ago. We have this big microbial age. And it's not until a half billion years ago that we had animals. And it looks like we'll only have animals for the same amount of time. That we animals are an endangered group. That a half billion years from now, probably conditions on this planet will be such that animals can no longer exist. So the mass extinctions, again, Hollywood got hold of this. It's so cool to think that a big rock from space and the asteroid that did do it, the dinosaurs, you can think of it, it is the size of Mount Everest. So round out Mount Everest a little bit and then drop it at 25 kilometers a second, and you, you really get the experiment that did a great deal of damage. We found the crater. The crater has been known for a long time, but it wasn't known to be a crater. It was just too big. It's one of those things like that great Gary Larson cartoon. They're standing in this enormous dinosaur footprint. And you see footprints? I don't see footprints. We knew about this thing for decades, but no one ever thought that a crater that young could be that big, and indeed it was. And we know that we had chemical indications of impact. This is simply an examination of one of these boundary sections of platinum group elements, iridium, that told us that, indeed, something big from space hit us. But the question then became, as I said already, that if not one, why not all of them? And this is a graph of the number of marine families through time. We start out at 600. That's the start of the age of animals 600 million years ago. When we go to zero the present day. And we see the trajectory of life on Earth. The Cambrian explosion, about 550 million years ago, rapid increase of life, bounces around a little bit, a huge divot at about 250 million years ago, and then up it goes. But in the middle of these, we have these interruptions, times when diversity drops. One of these caused by impact, why not all of them? And sometime in the last 20 years, every one has been blamed on impact. Well, we're seeing some indications that may not be the case. Science Cafe, so here's some science. These dots over on the left are carbon isotopes. Now, they're not carbon isotopes like carbon-14. This is an indication of planetary health. It's the amount of carbon-13 to the amount of carbon-12. And very simply, when this graph runs to the left, things are bad. That's an extinction. When it runs back to the right, in fact, you've got a runaway growth. You've got eutrophication. But the meat of this graph is that 251 million years ago, a gigantic mass extinction happened. Within 5 million years, the carbon, this is the carbon cycle, was swinging back and forth as if a giant bell had been rung. And you get these diminishing echoes. And then the top part from 247 up, the carbon cycle goes back to normal. It should be straight like this. This is not what the Cretaceous tertiary looks like. This is what happens when you have a succession of extinctions. And we're beginning to find out that these succession of pulses coincide with extrusion of an enormous amount of volcanic lava. And when lava comes up, carbon dioxide goes up. Lots of cool stuff died out in this Permian extinction. This was the biggest of the carnivores, the Gorgonopsian. Uh, there was actually a pretty cool, well, I liked it, uh, TV show from England called Primeval. And then the very first primeval, they had one of these, a Gorgonopsian, rush through a London supermarket plate glass window and go running up and down the stores, knocking cans off with his tail. So I like that quite a bit. Big creature growling. I, mean, I always wanted to see it in the movies, and there it was. So unfortunately, gone. And they were done in by the single largest mass extinction of all time. And our best guess, here's the, the great artist, Alexis Rockman. You're talking about artists on safari. Alexis actually went out with me into South Africa. 
Uh, he got lost once, driving the car, couldn't find us, drove into a prison, and we had to get him out of there. It was very strange. But he got to draw some of these things, and our best guess, he got very, very hot. And there were very few survivors. So from the center of the Earth, unfortunately, every once in a while, these things happen. This is a view of our Earth from a group in Berkeley. They moved all of, most of the mantle and the crust away, and they left behind the flood basalts. We have one. All of eastern Washington is covered by one of these flood basalts. It's the greatest crime against geology our state has ever had. I mean, you've got tremendously interesting geology and fossils covered by worthless basalt. <laughs> well, that, the best that can be said is you can grind it up and grow some pretty good wine on it, but other than that, you can make bird trays or something, but what are you going to do with basalt? Uh, it's bad stuff. When it comes up in large enough quantity, the basalt brings so much carbon dioxide, the world gets very hot. And each of these happened at a different time in history, and every time one of those things came up, there was a mass extinction. The bigger the extrusion, the bigger the extinction, because more carbon dioxide went up, global temperatures rose faster, and when that happens, very, very bad things happen. So this is a graph that was put together by a number of us, and I think it's extremely salient, and I wish we could send it to Congress. Because here we have carbon dioxide through time, and we're at the very top of the graph at time zero. That's where we are, a little dot. Except that if you go back through time, you find times when carbon dioxide is much higher. And that thousand is parts per million. We're at 390 right now, rising two per year. Every time there's been a thousand parts per million, or rising towards it, there's been a mass extinction. And in none of the cases above 1,000 ppm do we have ice, any ice at all. So oxygen is part of this. We have oxygen curves. I just wanted to show this one because we now know that oxygen itself is going up and down. But the real villain of this whole business is that hydrogen sulfide is produced in times with high carbon dioxide. So how can this be? High carbon dioxide makes the planet really warm, but as we're seeing now, oops, the Arctic and the Antarctic get really warm and the tropics don't. So you have a less and less temperature gradient between the poles and the equator. And when this happens, you reduce currents, you reduce wind. I laugh at all these movies about the future nasty climate to come. When it finally gets warm enough, there will be no wind. There will be no America's Cup or no kites. You have a really warm, equally temperature planet from pole to equator. There's nothing to produce ocean currents. And that's what happened with the Permian, at the end of the Triassic, at each of these mass extinctions. The planet warmed, currents slowed down, no more oxygen was brought to the bottom of the ocean, and a whole new type of bacteria took over. And these bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide. This is a really toxic gas. 200 to 800 parts per million severely affect humans, 800 will kill you. But this is 800 of these tiny little molecules among a million others. This is really tiny stuff. We are highly attuned to picking it up. Only a few parts per million from human flatulence will get you to leave the room. Or with my dog, it seems to about 200 parts per million wherever he goes. And we all leave the room. But we now know that every time we had a mass extinction, we now have record that these moments of slow current resulted in hydrogen sulfide release. So this was a, a hypothesis by Lee Kump from Penn State, and then it's very simple. It gets really warm, the warm slows the currents, the slow current lets a new type of microbe take over, and it's released into the water and into the atmosphere. The way we know is that there's a new type of paleontology taking place. These are biomarkers. These are organic molecules that are specific to a group of animals, or a group of plants, or a group of microbes. It's like a fingerprint, but it comes from a cell wall, a lipid, and they're so tough they can become fossilized. And the reason we know there was hydrogen sulfide is we're finding bacteria, the remains of the bacteria that both make hydrogen sulfide and have to have it to live all over at the same time we had the mass extinctions in shallow oceans. So we're seeing oceans that had no oxygen at the surface and a huge amount of hydrogen sulfide. The oceans would have been purple. The organisms that consume 
these, the microbes are purple, purple sulfur bacteria, and so we would have seen this great purple world. So we go back to what the world is like, and we see these isotopic shifts. The carbon cycle, the permo triassic the time of great flood of salt, the carbon cycle of going up and down mass extinctions. The Triassic-Jurassic, same thing. And finally, the Cretaceous tertiary. That's showing cycling too. And so the last part of the story is that four years ago, I was lucky enough to get a National Science Foundation grant to go to Antarctica for three separate trips. Here's my colleague Eric Steig and I going down here on one of the ships that took us down. Beautiful place to work, not a very nice place to live. By treaty, none of your waste can be left on the uh, continent. And so we were camping for a month, and everybody got their little little pile of sacks next to your tent, you know, kind of like cannonballs. The nice thing is it's, it's all frozen everywhere, so it's like a great outdoor freezer. Great fossils. This is Joe Kirchfink, the guy who got pummeled in the talk that I told you about. I haven't been hit yet. Uh, we are pulling out of this particular slide the biggest ammonite, which did die at the end of the Cretaceous, ever found in Antarctica. <coughs> Worked with Argentinians. The, it's a, quite a forbidding place. And we had snowstorms back and forth covering the fossils. Uh, the little bike here was, again, Joe Kirchfink decided that he was going to ride to work. And so he bought a bike on National Science Foundation money and put stunning tires on it. So, <laughs> so he was ready. You can see how well the bike worked in, in Antarctica. It went over the side at the end of it. OK, so let's finish up with sea level change. The mass extinctions were times when it got really warm. And when it gets really warm, ice caps melt. Ice cap melts. Oceans go up. We are at a time when it's getting really warm. Can we expect the same thing to happen? Well, there are lots of sea level changes through time. I mean, all these slides go away, but they seem not to have gone away. But we also know that not that long ago, sea level was higher than today. So in this particular graph now, we're looking at today in the center and that X. And anything down below is lower sea level. But you can see that even three million years ago, sea level was as much as 30 meters higher than now, 100 feet higher than now. So we are looking at a case now when not very long ago, when carbon dioxide was warmer as it was back then, that we had ice caps that were minimal in size. It wasn't very long ago. We know that carbon dioxide is going up. This is the record from the Hawaiian Observatory. We also know that Antarctica is getting warmer. This paper came out in Nature by Eric Steig and the group at UW when we were there. Uh, the reason this was interesting is that up to this point, the deniers of global warming had said, well, look, Antarctica is not getting warmer, but here was the first proof that indeed all the continents are getting warmer. And while we we're coming back, Eric Stein was denounced as a falsifier into the Senate record by a Senator Imhoff from Oklahoma. So we learned this on the boat. Uh, it's an interesting place. If it melts, we start losing a lot of Antarctica. And we already know that we're losing a great deal of the Arctic sea ice now. Arctic sea ice does not affect the level of the sea at all, because it's already floating in the ocean. You can melt all that you want. But Greenland, right next to it, has a huge effect. If we melt all of Greenland, we have a sea level rise of about 12 meters, 10 to 12 meters, and that's 36 feet. So I want to go in perspective what that means. We know that glaciers are going away. We know that if we go back through time, this is the carbon dioxide record. There's the year 1000, 1200, 1400, 16, 18 until today. This is the infamous graph known as the hockey stick, because it has a long, straight portion, and then it runs up in the red. Well, that's why it's getting warmer. There's nothing like that particular case going way, way back through time until what we're seeing is a more rapid rise in carbon dioxide than any time else in geological history we've ever been able to see. This is quite anomalous. So what is future temperature going to be? And here we go into models and modeling. And this is why it's so difficult and controversial. We can't exactly say what it's going to be. And so the ICPP comes together and gives us a series of graphs. You know, maybe global surface warming is going to be one degree by 2100, or maybe it's going to be two or three or four. 
or maybe it's going to be four before that. What we do know it is going up. What we don't know is how it high it will go up. And the scary thing is that you see graphs like this, they end at 2100, as if that's going to be the end of history. But you'll also see that every one of these curves, the red one that we really think is the most accurate one, is rising. It's asymptotic going up. The sea level will rise faster and faster as global temperature goes up higher and higher. And so here are the sea level curves that come from all this. In the year 2100, if we're lucky, it's only gone up one meter. But if we're not lucky, it's already up near two meters. And yet, Hansen and others in this last year, this was a 2007 graph, Hansen and others are now suggesting maybe four meters. Uh, th this, going back to this concept of change, we're just not going to let that happen. We can't let it happen. And once again, we have the amount of rise. And so now we've extended this graph way off in the future, where we're looking at four or five meters by 2300, by even the single most conservative of views. So the ocean is rising. Uh, the Seattle Tunnel by 2250 will be well covered by an awful lot of water. What happens? Let's very quickly end this. This is the effect of Bangladesh. If you have a 1.5 meter, um, about 15% of your population is driven out. But even worse than that, your growing areas. Bangladesh now feeds itself. They have three crops per year. They rotate beautiful tropical climate. But they can't feed themselves with a 1.5 meter sea level rise. And this is why the whole mass extinction thing comes back again. It's going to be food. In a world where there's 7 billion heading towards 10 billion, we can't afford to flood any agricultural land. And yet that's exactly the direction it seems we go. And here we have the impacted areas again of Bangladesh. It's just a case in point. So it's not just there, let's think about San Francisco. If you landed on San Francisco's airport, it's only about a meter above sea level. It's built out over the water. Well, that's going to be flooded and probably flooded the century. We've already seen what it costs for us to build a third runway. And so now let's look at not just the runways of places like this, but let's look at all of the areas where ships unload, where docks will have to be raised where if you have a tidal change, docks are already built for that. But in a lot of places, they're not. And so even CNN projected that there will be trillions of dollars in infrastructure costs associated with changing the wharfs, changing the areas where we have to get cargoes off cargo ships. One possibility, why don't you dam it? And San Francisco has already begun planning of building a dam right across the bay, right under the bridge. In fact, there's even a scheme to dam the entire Mediterranean and let the sea rise as it will. You know, we'll keep it the way it was in the past. But just the fact that people are even bringing this up shows you how peculiar and scared a lot of the world's leaders are when they actually confront this. But most people don't confront it. It's head in the sand. One meter does nasty stuff. I mean, clear enough, Florida enormously impacted. I want to finish up by our own area, sea level changes differently in different places. Let's go to Puget Sound. Here we're looking at Seattle now, and we see from 1900 to the present. In fact, we have been rising about two times the national average. That our tunnel now is square one, I think, of what should have been a more expensive debate, but it never happened. And rising sea level, I think, is going to be something in all of our futures. So let me stop with that. I'll probably run too long anyway. Thank you.